Hello, I'm Alex Mansfield, the host of Manny Talk Shooting, and welcome to another episode. This is the shooting podcast where I talk to individuals all across the shooting industry. We'll talk competition, self-defense, concealed carry. If you like this content, check out our YouTube channel, Manny Talk Shooting. And without further ado, let's get to this episode. The title sponsor of Manny Talk Shooting is Go Fast Don't Suck. So if you need match banners for your match, check them out. They also have an awesome selection of pre-designed and custom mobile jerseys. Don't forget, they are the home of the dry fire decals for your wall, so get those too. They've also got a plethora of patches and stickers that are hilarious and true. You know, Go Fast Don't Suck has a lot of things that you'll need on the range and off, so please check them out at GoFastDon'tSuck.net. Welcome everybody, welcome back to another installment of Manny Talk Shooting, the shooting podcast on the internet because i'm not brian conley i don't have a magical mystery tour and i'm stuck in my side room it's okay it's many talk shooting uh we are sitting down with today today a man who likes to go three two one and play with px4 storms it's it's keanu sai how you doing keanu i'm all right alex thanks for having me on here thank you for coming on i know it was a little bit of a shocker and like why do you want to talk to me and i blame <laughs> i blame ben it's it's all ben's fault i blame no. ben for a lot of problems it's okay yeah, he, he, he likes to uh, entice everyone with PX4s and uh, convert a lot of people. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. We'll talk about CSRG, um, match directing stuff, all this cool all those cool topics in the show. But first, for people who don't know you, who are you and how did you get into shooting? Yeah, sure. Um, my name is Keanu. Obviously, I'm a USPSA Carry Optics Grandmaster. Uh, not a very good one, but I am one. Uh, and uh, I started shooting... I've been shooting since I was like eight years old, but that's like, I've been shooting like small, like, you know, uh, rim fire rifles and stuff like that. Rim fire rifles, like 22 handguns and stuff like that. So I really didn't get into serious shooting until I turned, um, until I turned 18 when I started shooting NRA high power in the CMP service rifle competition. So I've been to Camp Perry a few times. Um, and I've shot, uh, and I've shot, you know, like iron sights at like 600 yards on, on NRA, uh, I don't remember what they're called, SR targets or something like that, um, MR targets, and that was kind of how I got started. And then I, uh, the whole USPSA thing started because I watched the Dynamic Pi video on the high point, and I watched them shooting that gun like on the stage, and I was like, oh, that looks really cool. And then I see Ben Steiger come up, and I'm like, who's this guy? And I watched, I started watching videos of Ben shooting, and I was like, holy smokes, I, I really want to, I want to try this. So after turn 21, I got a Glock 19. Um, and then I started shooting IDP. I shot one IDPA match and then I shot a USPSA match and then I never shot IDPA again. That was the only IDPA match I've ever shot in 20, that was 2017. And then since then I've been, uh, 2017 all the way until now I've been shooting USPSA pretty much exclusively, um, shot IPSC for the first time last year and then shot it again, um, uh, in November of last year as well. And that was a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, I've, it's been, and then, you know, I've taken on crazy responsibilities. I went from, from just being some schmuck at a local indoor match, you know, shooting there every week. I started, and I started running that match when that match director left. And then, uh, I, I got lucky enough to have, uh, a, a local outdoor club, um, uh, come to me along with another match director. So I was a co-match director with that club. And then I got to run Area 8 twice, and then I've run the Maryland State Championship twice, and then this is our third year now. Um, and the Maryland State Championship is at my home club, the Thermont Conservation Sportsman Club. And so, yeah, it's been it's it's been a ride with uh, with USPSA for me. Yeah, I can definitely say that is. Uh, you go from the gambit of doing a bunch of different things and, you know, a carry optics grandmaster, even though you, you say you're not a good one. Uh, it's <laughs> kind of funny. I, I looked up Nationals... Uh, results and then we won't talk about that because it's just you know it's always uh it's always like you can if you want to i I don't i don't really care but it was it was a good time but it was it was not the right time to switch guns which is what i did the week before (laughs) i mean it it was all peer pressure i i it's not your fault it might be your fault but it it was i peer pressured my friends into peer pressuring me to yeah, switch guns. Well, and there's always a, there's a, a decent amount of footage of you. It seems like on uh, the internet with you shooting that. So, like, oh look, yeah, look. USPSA loves to post that chat GPT post, whatever <laughs> or whoever writes that thing. Right. Yeah. The, the, the poorly written Instagram post. Yeah, with uh, with you shooting your PX4. <laughs> it's, I love it every time. If like every other week, it's just USPSA, and I, the first thing I see is me shooting the PX4. I'm like, yeah, more publicity for the <laughs> PX4. Yeah, there you go. 
Oh, that and that's always the funny part. But um, oh, so you you know you said you did uh, NRL, um, no NRA, uh, bench rest, you know, and CMP going to Camp Perry. Um, did you you enjoyed that for a while, and um, and then do you, do you still do the dabble at all in that or no? No, I actually I, I don't think I've shot a rifle in. You know, the last time I shot a shoulder fired, no, no, I shot machine guns. That doesn't count. Um, but the last time I shot like a boring semi-auto, you know, normal person gun was like a year and a half ago. But I, I haven't shot like I haven't shot one of my own rifles in years. That means you just need to sell them and get a PX4. <laughs> I, I have four of them. I don't need to sell anymore. <laughs> You need the carbine now. <laughs> you gotta get the the the, the CX four storm. Yeah, there you go. All, all the storm. All the I've time. thought about it. I, I've genuinely thought about it, but I can't bring myself to do it because a sixteen inch PCC just seems so stupid. Mm-hmm. Like if I had to get one, I'd get the 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 Ruger PC nine charger or whatever the heck that is. That thing's that thing looks cool. Yeah, that is pretty interesting looking. But um, <clears throat> yeah, PCC it makes me jitter. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. I, I got goosebumps right now. PCC, I, I, it's okay. It's it's something I'm gonna dabble in. I'm I'm, gonna, I'm building mine, so eventually we'll get there. I will too. I have a high point carbine upstairs that I want to use one time, and I, I put a night force on it a few years ago, and then I never actually shot, and I sold a night force, which is a shame because I never got to flex that at a match. Right. Oh, I mean, yeah. If you shot a a rifle match or something like a PCSL rifle match or something, be like, look at all this money in my optic. Look at it. <laughs> With my one hundred fifty dollar chrome rifle. Yes. <laughs> But you mentioned that high point video. I think that 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 high, that high point video is hilarious, though. I, I love it. I, I love high points, by the way. So I, I own I, I own three high points. So are you gonna? Sh- that's what you need to do is shoot production with a high point for for, for just for the lols. I don't have a production legal high point out here. Hang on. For the viewers who can see, I need to try and find one. I have a high point here that is. Let me probably... just dig it. In. Let me dig it out of this bucket, right? I literally have a bag of guns next to me. Hey, nothing wrong with that. This is my high point. It's got a comp. What's it's got high? a comp. So this is actually originally a 380, and I reamed it out to nine millimeter. They have a three. They have a threaded barrel for a high point. It's not. It's not threaded. It's it's a clamp on. Oh lord. <laughs> so there's like a there's like a there's a cut there's a cut in the barrels for the screw to go through, and it doesn't really stay on very well. You can you you can turn it with your hands. Um, but yeah, this was this was my first high point, and I love this gun. It cost me ninety dollars. Hey, nothing nothing wrong with uh, uh, cheap guns, right? And I made it nine millimeter all by myself. So your means you're a gunsmith. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Don't do what I do at home. But right, I'm just exactly. saying the three eighty slide and nine millimeter slide, they weigh the same. I mean, doesn't all, is it, wait? You mean it's a brick? It's that's all. It's all you're saying is yeah, but they're the same weight brick. Like the oh. forty five, my my four, my my forty five high point is a heavier brick. Oh, this is true. But it has sex appeal because it's forty five, right? Because they don't mm-hmm. make it. It's also a limited edition OD green, and apparently, yeah, I've I've gone to gun broker and looked up the recent, the the um, completed sales on the OD green high points, and people those are actually those go for more money. <laughs> there are people out there who value the spray paint color of one high point over the other by a factor of like fifty to one hundred dollars. What? Oh, yeah, I'm not Lord. kidding. Hey, you're gonna have you're gonna have an investment item there soon. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so, uh, uh, so you said you started, you know, you know, helping out with an indoor match, though, then running an outdoor match, uh, running area eight. Um, what made you so in the first place? You know, you started with that indoor match. Mm-hmm. Um, how did you feel that went? How did I what? How did you feel that that went? Was it was it that went really party? well? That was we were actually one of the most active clubs in the country um, from 2018 to 20 to the end of 2019 um, mm-hmm. we ran one match we had we had a match every week except for the first week of the month so um you know i've i've run north of at, at this point I've, I've had to have run almost 100 uspsa matches wow that, um, that is a lot of matches a lot it usually yeah. takes people a lot long well when you can shoot three weeks out of the month the same yeah well it's, it's not really a fair comparison because i run you know and it, it was it was good though because we had we had like a really really nice core group mm-hmm. um we probably so it was, it was only 24 people in the match okay was um, that, so two squads in or one big squad? it was two, it was two squads and we had two bays and we would shoot 
um, we, we would shoot two stages in each bay, and you know it would be like a different target order or a different start position, or we'd um, lay some targets down so it would alter the stage or something, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was a really really good time. I, I'm actually bummed that the 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 management at that range actually kicked us out mm. uh, because it was a it was purely a profit thing, um, just because their margins were better renting the range out and renting guns and stuff like that. But, you know, I understand, but the, I was just a little sour from it because they, they kicked us out without saying anything to us. And I was, I, I was trying to contact one of their guys, um, uh, our, our liaison for that, for that, uh, uh, shooting range because I wasn't technically an employee there. Uh, and he was just ghosting me, ghosting me. And then I finally see him and he, I'm like, dude, what happened? He was just like, dude, they shut down the match and I, I wanted to tell you, but I don't work there anymore. <laughs> so, like, so yeah, everything after COVID, everything went upside down. They kind of that was they used that I I assume as a, as the excuse to get us out of there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, but it, it was a good match. Um, we had like a really really good small group of people that were it was pr- it was more or less the same twenty four people every uh, and maybe one or two new people every uh, every week. So, and that was the only matches they they've shot. I've never seen about half of those guys I've never seen at any other club um, even my outdoor match now which is 15 minutes away from that where that range is mm-hmm. yeah so that yeah that, that does suck when they kicked you out you know that it, you know com- open communication is a lot better than uh, yeah ghosting and it doesn't doesn't but uh, yeah I shoot a, every other Monday night indoor match in the winter and it fills up within an hour or so because of the same people everyone signs up and all that yeah yeah, the NRA match down in Fairfax is the same way. It's, mm-hmm. I mean, it fills up in less than two minutes. Yeah, but you have an interesting problem in Area Eight. Uh, the The population density is far greater yep. than uh, most places, so you're fighting to get in any any match. It seems like down there. Yeah, um, yeah, it's it's crazy. Especially I learned during winter time. I thought no one wanted to shoot during winter, and then I, and then I, all my friends were like, "Dude, you should host matches during winter." And so I. I decided this year to start hosting winter matches for the first time out, you know, at our outdoor club and our winters aren't that bad. You know, it, it might go down to like the twenties on the bad days. Um, but on your normal days, it's in the forties, usually thir- you know, mid thirties to mid forties. So it's by all means reasonable. Yeah. Layer up and you'll be okay. It's yeah. Be and the, um, the problem is the wind again, like up at my club, it, it gets really gusty. Um, but I, I was actually, I was freaking taken aback in January when our, our match, uh, our, first winter match opened uh, i had 80 people on the wait list wow and it was it's so and the match was already at capacity at 75 people that is that is insane that, yeah and i had about 30 or 40 last uh uh last week too mhm so it's yeah this this area is in a we're in a very good spot in area eight. Um, it's hard to get into matches, but there are a lot of matches to shoot. If you live, if you live in Maryland or Northern Virginia, you can shoot two matches a week within two hours. Yeah. That's um, pretty much anywhere. Th- and I mean, if, those are those diehards who love to shoot. Right. So they, I can't, I don't blame mm-hmm. them. I mean, mm-hmm. if my budget allowed me to shoot two matches a weekend, you know, go, you know, go here, go there. I, I would totally do it. Oh yeah. 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 So, um, when you left that indoor range, did you go straight to, uh, Thermont or did you go to a different club first? <sighs> Uh, I'm trying to think of the, well, so there were no matches. This happened. So the, the indoor matches stopped in the beginning of 2020. Um, mm-hmm. the range had closed for renovations in the first place at the beginning of, uh, in early 2020. So we weren't having matches there anyway. Right. Um, so I was kind of shut down for the winter. Um, and then the, uh, and then, you know, with COVID restrictions and all that stuff, well, there was kind of a delay in getting matches started. And then actually the match, the prior match director of Thermont, he actually passed away in, I think, April of 2020. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, so the club was scrambling to find um, uh, new leadership. So they actually, they, they tapped a buddy of mine who was a member at that club. I was a member of the, I was not a member at the club at this time, mm-hmm. um, but they, uh, they asked him to run the match and he reached out to me and he said, Hey, will you be my co-match director to, to help me get this club off the ground? Um, so, uh, so, I mean, it, it really wasn't a lag time you think about it just because of, you know, COVID shutdowns and stuff like that. We really didn't have a lag time in shooting season outside of what the government, you know, uh, restricted us from doing. Right. 
Gotcha. So that's interesting, but that's good. You know, you and your buddy tagged in and you, uh, you kept the, the matches going there alive. So mm-hmm. that, that's not nothing wrong with that. Um, all while, uh, rising through the ranks or, uh, by this point, were you already a GM or were you still? still- no, I was still, um, I was actually limited in production back then. So okay. I was a, um, I was a limited master then in production A class. Silly production. You can shoot 15. It was now. so, it was, I liked it. I really like production. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but the way stages are set up now, um, 15 rounds is fine. Um, mm-hmm. It's, you, you gain a lot uh, just in stage execution just by having 15 rounds instead of 10. But just the way our sport is now um, and just the way, you know, in practical terms and how, and how you carry and how you're going to keep your home defense gun and all that stuff. There's nothing I don't have. There's no handgun. I, I plan on using that won't have an optic on it anyway. Mm-hmm. So why bother? Yeah. I mean, other than the, the law match or the, the class of like the, the random, I'm just going to get classified or bump my classification in this division. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I don't, I, I, my gun handling skills aren't good enough to make GM in production right now anyway. So, um, I would be contently default master in production in yeah, whatever other, other divisions I try. All right. So you become the co-match director at Thermont, and uh, you've been doing that since you left the indoor, which is awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, and you've been host. You've hosted Maryland there, or you're hosting Maryland for the first time, or no? So we've hosted the Maryland. So the Maryland State Championship was something that kind of waned out. The I want to say about ten years ago. Um, 10 or 12 years ago. And then someone at the club said we should bring it back. So I spoke to, um, I, I spoke to my co MD and he agreed that would be a pretty good idea to do it. And it was good. It, it was good timing too, because that was my, um, the year we started talking about doing it. I wasn't going to be running area eight after that. So I only ran area eight for, tw- for two years. Right. And then the third year, um, we did Maryland state instead. Oh, okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it was. Uh, I I didn't have to, you know, run two majors in one year or anything like that or anything crazy. But th- that this will this year will be our third year doing it. Third year running Maryland. Well, yeah, that's and it'll good. be in September of uh, end of September this year instead of end of June because of yeah. Carry Optics Nationals. Thanks, Jake. Yeah. Well, yeah. Carry Optics is in June is a little interesting because that's your biggest. It, it, it's a, It's weird. It, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Right. Other than oh, people will be done shooting carry optics, so now they'll go shoot limited optics. That will, yeah, that's that's kind of my thought too with that. I mean, hey, they got they got to sell matches, so they might as well, right? So, um, mm-hmm. but yeah, last year was really weird. Everything was front heavy. It was everything was like April, May, June, the nationals, and then it was dead, and then yep. there was just the other majors throughout the year. Because I yeah. don't, I I actually hosted a major match in twenty twenty three, and I was forced to put it in uh april due to scheduling of local clubs around me yeah and and nationals and other majors it's like i'm stuck putting it on some random weekend in april yep sat we we shot a saturday sunday match uh saturday was beautiful sunny bright you know warm sunday came it was rain and crap and it's like this is why we don't shoot in april for major matches yeah yeah i'm sure it's 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 been the same struggle with uh uh, with us too, because of all the lo- uh, of all the local majors going on. Um, it's the beginning of the year. We have like Delmarva, and I don't, I don't really want to run a major match this early in the year in the first place. Mm-hmm. Um, May or June is probably is usually the earliest I want to run it. But then we have to my club. We have to be on the fourth weekend because of all the other disciplines being scheduled on other weekends. So we're trying not to intrude on their weeks. Um, right. But uh, um. Like between you know area eight or uh, area eight or Western PA or Mid Atlantic and you know Virginia State and all of those, it's really hard to pick a weekend. And that between that and having you know two hundred different nationals matches, mm-hmm. like it was really nice that one year where they did back to back nationals. It was nine days of nationals. And it was you know that was that was probably the best in, in my opinion. That was the best way to execute nationals if you're going to do it. Right. Yeah. From a, a financial uh, standpoint and logistics, huge logistics standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this, I, I've talked to a plenty of staff who shot, who worked it and they were like, absolutely sucked. We, we, I'm we, sure uh, I'm a hundred percent certain it sucked. <laughs> yeah. But, for, but, 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 but from an organizational perspective and from a shooter's perspective mm-hmm. and, you know, just and in courtesy to other, 
um, match directors for majors. It, mm -hmm. it makes a lot more sense. Right. Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, so you, you mentioned Delmarva, right? So De Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia, like that's the section, right? That's, yeah, so we're in the Delmarva section in uh, in USPSA. We actually have Shadowhawk is in West Virginia, but they're, they have a they have a affidavit or a waiver or something um, that says yeah. they're part of the Delmarva section in Area 8. Yeah, it may, honestly, in my opinion, uh, and I'm an Area 5 guy, which West Virginia is a part of Area 5, y'all can have them. Like, there's yeah. nothing but there. the panhandle is literally smushed between Virginia and Maryland, so it might as well, like, you drive through it, and you're going, if you drive, you know, 50 minutes through the panhandle, you're in one state or the other. Right, yeah, it makes no sense to it to be a part of Area 5, like, it, it, it just doesn't make sense. But, yeah. So that's cool, but so, <clears throat> so, so. You so, but you get to run a state championship because you're part of a bigger section of three states. Now, um, Delmarva, yeah, Delmarva. Um, how many clubs are in that section? There are a lot, right? Um, thirty like at least. I don't think it's thirty. Um, so, I'm just trying to think off the top of my head. Um, so in Maryland, you have uh, you have Thurmont. You have AGC. I don't think they're running matches anymore, though. You have Anne Arundel Fish and Game, uh, which is a really good match, by the way. So if you're in the area, you should 100% shoot AAPS. Um, and then in Virginia, you have Northern Virginia Gun Club. Uh, you have a couple down in Virginia Beach, I think. You have Cavalier down in Richmond. Um, you have Fredericksburg. And then you have Fair. You have uh, NRA or Fairfax. Uh, and then, I'm trying to think of what else. I don't think there used to be Bridgeville, but Bridgeville USPSA doesn't exist anymore. There, there's Eastern Shore um, out in Sudlersville. So I don't know. Maybe there are about 10, mm -hmm. 10 USPSA clubs, at least the ones that I know of. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if I'm missing any. May or may not be. I mean, yeah, but we're so close to the mid Atlantic sectional section too. So a lot of people drive up to Pennsylvania, like York. Um, York is a really, really popular match. Um, Russell Fortney's match, and then uh, West West Shore is really popular down in up uh, or up in Harrisburg. Um, and then there's also like New Holland and stuff like that. So you know, within this area, you, you're not really restrained if you're if, in a two hour radius. You're not really restrained to just the, just the Delmarva section. Right. Yeah, and that's the cool thing. But uh, I, I, I can definitely see where. Having that three state section is uh, is interesting because mm -hmm. there are so many clubs and you have to handle manage that. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because I already know it's hard enough to deal with nine in our section. You know, it's just the Michigan section, so we're all mm -hmm. dealing with dates and weekends. And I mean, even that, like, even the my old my old home club that I was a member of that I ran that major match at um, that I'm no longer affiliated with. But uh, yeah, we were stuck in shot uspsa on the first weekend of the month because that's everything co-lined with whatever else was happening and you're like can't change it unless yeah you're bending over backwards to accommodate other people <laughs> yeah yeah for sure yeah no i think our scheduling as far as like not butting into other matches it works pretty well for us mm -hmm. so we all get together in the section meeting and we, we kind of talk about schedules and all of our clubs are generally on good terms with each other so I mean, off the top of my head, I can tell you the exact schedule now. So for the first weekend, like, I mean, you you almost never have buddy heads, which is good. So the first weekend, you have Anne Arundel on Saturday. You have Fredericksburg on Sunday. Um, second weekend, you have Shadowhawk or Quantico, but, and they both run Saturday, Sunday, so you can do either one. Mm -hmm. um, third weekend, you can do um, GRB, or you can do York or West Shore. Um, and then the fourth week, you can do Eastern Shore, Anilani, um, which is, and that's like three hours away, but a lot of people still go up there. You have uh, you, you have my match, which is Thermont, Anilani, or Eastern Shore. So you you have a pretty good pick, and no clubs are really stealing from any anyone else, which is good. So most people generally have pretty good. The clubs usually have it pretty together here. Oh yeah, hundred percent. And that's the nice thing is you know you're not really stealing. You're like you're in the same section, but you're you know the same weekends, but you uh you can still manage to fill the match and still have wait lists because yeah. No, I'm benefit of this population, right? Yeah, you can't, you can't, can't beat that for sure. So, I guess I, so. Was Area Eight at Thermont when you ran it, or did you run it at a different? No, I ran it at Shadowhawk for two years. Okay, how did that work? Were you a member of Shadowhawk, or did they just ask you to be the match director at that? So they there? don't do memberships um, there. That's a private 
it's 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 a private club and oh, they're okay. pretty picky. Like you can go there and you can rent a bay, mm-hmm. um, but I don't think they do memberships. Um, it's a really nice facility though. So if if you are passing by, it's a beautiful, it's a gorgeous place. Um, but uh, no, it was I don't know how my name came up, but like I think uh, Kevin McPhee, the last year he directed before Ted. His term just ended, um, and then it was Ted Murphy was the uh, de facto winner because he was the only person running. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he was looking for an area match director, and for some reason, my my friend brought his name up. My, my friend, who was the section coordinator at the time for Delmarva, brought his name up to uh, or brought my name up to him, and I, and I was like, okay, well, sure, I guess. Right. I wasn't sure about it, and the first year was honestly a train wreck. Um, I had I had a really really rough running it the first year. Um, the the I had some. That was my first time doing a three-two-one format like that, ever, um, mm-hmm. and it was really hard to iron out the the stage flow and the turnover between the squads and everything. And we had some prop failures. We had to throw out a stage that caused it back up on another stage. Um, we had poor setup on another stage that had a lot of that had a lot of one eighty calls. Um, so it was, um, and then we had some. Uh, we had some calibration issues and a lot of some people a lot of people complain about the poppers the first year um mm-hmm. and the next year we didn't have any of that a- any of those problems at all so you know first year first year running a major that was a huge teething thing for me yeah well and you know the second one's always going to be better because you learn from the first one yeah yeah and, and and that's 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 what matters right is you, you learn from the first one so that you didn't have to deal with that in the second one right yeah my, my only issue with that is i had 400 people who had to suffer through that and that i, I wasn't too I, I wasn't too keen on i want right. people to suffer on the stages when they're shooting and i want them to hate their own shooting <laughs> like yeah, i not, do yeah not just but i don't want them out. to hate the actual match right but i mean you didn't have issues selling out well and that's a nice thing it, about it never will i don't yeah. think that's very fair to say though right well, right. If you if it was a horrible match and everybody said it, right, people like there would have been slots open in the match, right? There there would have been, you, you know, you know. I, I have ex- I experienced that. We my ma- my club ran area five in twenty two, and then in twenty three, twenty two was so difficult and hard. They were like, we don't want to come back. It's like, mm-hmm. well, we lived and learned. We didn't sell out the match, unfortunately, but it was. We learned. We had a, we had a better match the second year, but yeah, I, I didn't think my match was. I don't think any of my majors have been like unfairly hard. Mm-hmm. Um, and I actually had a, a Tim Heron really likes my matches, so he 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 came out for the last two area eights I ran. Um, and then I've been he wants he's he's been trying to come to Maryland State, but the scheduling hasn't worked for him. He said he's going to try and make it this year because um, mm-hmm. he always likes the formats I run. Maybe because it's, it's, my matches are usually pre- usually pretty low cap friendly. Um, yeah. Well, but, uh, it, it, it kind of helps when you do a three, two, one, right? So if it's a twelve round stage, you're doing one. If you're a single stack, you're doing one reload. Yeah. Right? Well, it's it's not even it's it's not even the round counts. It's more of just the way I design stages. I always try and avoid having like I, I really try and avoid having um, single positions that require more than six or seven rounds. Um, and just and I think that makes it more interesting because then you if you disperse the round count more across the entire stage. It makes the stage a lot more interesting as far as the execution goes and as far as stage planning goes. Because if you have one position where you have, you know, let's say if you're in a 20, 24 round stage and you have one position where it's going to be eight rounds, that's 24, that's 25% of your stage right there. Right? Mm-hmm. I mean, what's the, and then how, how many, how many matches end up doing the eight rounds here, eight rounds there, eight rounds here, eight rounds there? And then no. Far too many. Yeah. Or they're like, oh, we're going to, it's a 18 round stage. You can shoot 10 from here and eight from here. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And then you have, yeah. And, and I think low cap shooters really do. Um, I don't know why, but I, I, re- I really do sympathize with low cap shooters for some reason. Um, well, but somebody like, has to, right. <laughs> somebody has to feel their pain. But it's, it's like a, it's a really big dick move when you say, you know, the rule book says that you can only shoot eight rounds from a single viewing position. And the match directors really abuse the term shooting position because it's like, Oh yeah, well you shoot eight rounds on this side, you do a reload and then you have shoot eight rounds at, you know, 180 degrees away. And that's considered two viewing positions because you can't see 180 degrees like that when you're shooting those. I'm like, dude, come on, really? Yeah, it's it's the it's the lazy ones that make everything. Everyone else gets a bad rap because of yeah. the lazy few. Yep. But you know, everyone agreed they liked your three two one format. I don't know if it was because of you could fit more. Did, how many? Um, a better question is how many stages did you have when you did? It was only thirteen. One? So. So you could shoot it in a, a single format day, or was it? A, or did you try to do it in a half day? It was only a. I think this year's area eight up at um, 
up in the greater Pittsburgh mm-hmm. um, at the Bob at Bill Drummond's club. This mm-hmm. is the this this will be the first year that it's been two two day format. Okay, so it's usually been so a single day. Even format. at Onalani at, at Onalani at Shadowhawk, it's always been a one day format. Um, but I know Onalani usually runs a little bit longer because it's bigger stages. Um, right. But for us, I mean, we had shooters starting at nine o'clock, eight o'clock, and they were done by three, which I think is pretty good. Yeah, you know um, it, the staff liked it. <laughs> the, the staff really liked it. Well, yeah, because you're not starting at O Dark Thirty and getting done at O Dark Thirty. It's yeah, that's happened before too. At Area Eight, um, I shot Area Eight in 2018 at Onalani, and I'm not going to fault you know anyone at that club for anything, but I, I think it's just because of the volume of the, the the round count, the volume of props, and you know just the general format of that match. It's all large stages. Um, and it's all like a lot of running around and stuff like that. So, you know, the, the more of that you have, the longer resets going to take. Um, yeah. But, yeah. But I think um, the range didn't close until probably six o'clock. Um, mm-hmm. Or last shots were until like six o'clock um, when I was there on Saturday. Something like that. Yeah. It's almost like uh, what they call it uh, at Carry Optics Nationals in Bama that one time. Oh, hand um, flashlight nationals or something. Like that. <laughs> yeah. That was just last year, wasn't it? No, or no, two years that, ago. I guess last year was technically was, in Ohio. Yeah, it was probably the last one in. Uh, it was either the last one or the first Carry Optics Nationals in Talladega. Yeah, but uh, either way, uh, you know, no, the staff are the ones who get really screwed because they're the ones there all day, and uh, it, yeah, I, I yeah. sympathize with them because I am one of those people typically, and I'm like, Ugh, that, I mean, yeah, same. I mean, yeah. if I'm running the match, I'm I'm there as as long as the staff are usually longer. Yeah. Um. So. So yeah, I, I try and make sure the matches are done quick. So like Maryland State, we shoot from it's eleven stages, and we shoot from nine o'clock in the morning to usually about three in the afternoon. Oh, that's that's still pretty good. Yeah. No, that's it's yeah, and then most staff are at the hotel drinking by four. Mm, see, that's a nice thing, right? Beer, beer thirty. You know. Yeah. Good, it, and I thank you for watching another episode of Manny Talk Shooty. I greatly appreciate it. And if you could do me a favor, please go patronize our sponsors here when you are available. We've got Hunter's HD Gold, Go Fast, Don't Suck, Outdoor Dynamics, Make Stuff Better, Range Panda, Southern Barbecue, Laugh and Load, Summit City Bullets, Two Alpha Apparel, and Tom Castro Shoot Academy. Now let's get back to this episode. I don't know. Have you, do you stick around and hang out with the staff at the staff hotel? Or do you yeah, I do. Uh, it, so for the staff dinner, for the staff dinner, I'll, I'll hang out with them. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, if, if I'm at the hotel, I will. Um, my club's 45 minutes from me, so I won't be doing a hotel this year. Right. Um, and I, I'd rather stay home with my family Yeah. Uh, day over day. But, uh, mm. I mean, usually I'll hang out with, at them with, the, you know, with them at the range or stuff like that. And, um, yeah, I, I have a good relationship with most staff, I like to think. Yeah, well, in, in the stories, the cool stories you get to hear from all these different people at different mm-hmm. matches, like, that's, yeah. the, that's the cool thing, right? You, you, you get to hear these stories and... You're like, oh, that's pretty cool. You know, I've never seen that on a stage or some, you know, the horror stories they get to you get to hear from them. It's always a it's always a good time. Yeah, yeah. So but either way, the takeaway from this is for any future match directors, take care of your staff because they will take care of you. Yes, yes. We 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 try to do that as uh, ROs. We we definitely try to make the match director and range master's life easy. And mm-hmm. the, the sooner you can catch a problem, the better. Like, hey, this popper's being finicky. You know, you tell somebody sooner than later instead of getting called mr fix it getting called every other shooter because it decides to be a pain in the ass and yeah yeah i've had that i've had that or hey um your popper design is great although you need to replace this board because you are literally chewing the crap out of it because uh, <laughs> i don't know if you've ever seen a targets usa popper right um there's it's, it's essentially sure. um a bracket around the popper and it's got a hook right but okay most match directors will mount them on a two by four or a two by six so they can drill holes in that and then right. mount that to the ground. Yeah. Um, this board was not brand new when the match started. It was about three quarters of, you know, it, was, it still had three quarters of its life left to live as a board. Um, by the end of the match, well, the end of the first day of the shooting match, the board had pretty much disintegrated. I'm like, all right, well, we get, <laughs> like tonight before you leave, someone please fix and replace and make sure it's in the same spot because it was marked on the ground. It was by paint. Yeah. So I was like, all right, cool. Uh, we calibrate it again and uh, get this done before shooters come tomorrow because this board will not last the rest of the match. And and see, 
things that can come up, they get fixed and no problem. So. Yep. Yeah. But uh, so that's cool. You ran Area Eight. You're running Maryland. This will be your third year in Maryland uh, running this match. Um, does this match move typically, or are you the suckers who always say yes? <laughs> so the Maryland, so the Maryland State Ch- Championship is solely run by us right now um, because there isn't there isn't like a Maryland section, right? Because we're under the, under the Del Marva section. There's no there's no governance for the state of Maryland as far as USPA State is concerned. So it's kind of just like the clubs in Maryland. Like I send an email out and I just say, "Hey, we want to have this match again." Um, I wouldn't say we're suckers because we're the ones volunteering to have the match, and we like having the match. My club really likes having the match because it's a lot of money in their pocket, um, yeah. and you know all that they can spend that money on range improvements and stuff like that. So uh, they're 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 really happy with that, and they never they will never say no to hosting a match. So it's it, it's pretty much just kind of someone speak up if you don't want us to run it and no one's spoken up so far um gotcha. i know that uh southern maryland that was another club i forgot southern maryland out in um on the western shore of maryland uh they're building like they're building like 15 bays somewhere in that area um and they want to host it one day and i said great i said even better though you should have you should build five more bays and host nationals yeah, I mean that's absolutely a, a, an option. Like we need more ranges that can accommodate more shooters. Like that's that's the trick, right? Well, we gotta... need more good ranges that can accommodate shooters because I definitely wouldn't put um, I definitely wouldn't put Cardinal in in the good range category. Some 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 bays are fine. A lot of the new bays, all the new bays are fine. But I don't know why I don't know why USPSA picked to have a match. Uh, in in a club where half the bays are fundamentally indoor ranges yeah i yeah i wonder i mean it was probably from the the uh was it the was it the same was did cardinal become the was that their first year when they were supposed to have the four-day nationals down in um out in colorado as well no talladega took that year um from them okay so cardinal i think cardinal was the was the whole new big thing Gotcha. I, and I've asked the guys who, who run local club matches out of there. I'm like, why don't you, why can't we just slap, you know, nine new more bays behind the new bays? And we just kind of, you know, you're just shooting all into one berm. Yeah. From both, you know, both sides, obviously, you know, so, but you have all new, you know, all new bays, right? And maybe, maybe they'll do it. I don't know. Um, I don't know what the, the facility makes way more money due to shotgun than they'll ever will with practical pistols. So, yeah, I'm, I'm certain of that. Mm hmm. But I mean, the facility's decent. Like you could, you, the SASP championships are there all the time too. So uh, they've got they've got big draw there. So people still um, shoot that. Yeah, kids kids shoot it all the time. The shotgun version and the the rimfire version. So, oh wow! Yeah, I think they're typically there after Carry Optics Nationals. So okay, which is interesting. It's nothing really good like there's so many disciplines that actually go on at the cardinal shooting center even though that's mostly shotgun mm-hmm. like you wouldn't even know like uh gotta it's gotta be like at least a mile down the road is there's um skeet um like that way past the yeah so if you go down a side road you'll find skeet like on a side entrance it's like oh yeah well, that, i think that's how we got into the range at nationals we mm-hmm. we drove down the the back way uh, not through the main entrance yeah, well, uh, so, there's like two sideways to come in. Like you come, yeah, it's it's kind of interesting how you can. Get it's a huge that. facility. I just wish they could build better pistol bays. Yeah, well, yeah, and I, and I've asked the guys there too. It's like, why don't we get? Why can't you just tear down ba- the the wood slap bays and just bring in some more dirt? Like you're not. They're wide enough too. Yeah, you can. Yeah, it's easy peasy. Put some more dirt here and call it a day. But or just do Hescos. Something. Something could be something. Uh, but anyway, but uh, I, I would love to find a, this is my personal opinion, uh, you can agree or disagree, uh, or not say anything at all because it's okay. I would think we need a place that can hold a four-day match so you can fit enough people into the match and call it a day. It's called Frostproof. There's already a club. Universal Shooting Academy. It's the best club in the country. Other than the occasional hurricane. Yeah, the occasional, <laughs> the occasional hurricane. This is. True. I mean, I'm serious though. I mean, that was that that to me that is seriously the best place to host nationals because they can have like 20 some odd stages, um, in, the, in their own bays, and that's that's in, nice. in their own bays, right? And they're all pretty generously sized bays. Mm-hmm. Um, the range is laid out perfectly. All the bays are next to each other or across from each other. Everything's easy to get to. Everything makes sense and frost proof. If you want, I mean, 
there's housing in Orlando, which is 45 minutes or an hour away. Sebring's 30 minutes away. I mean, there's no housing directly in Frost Proof usually, but um, if you want like good food, if you want to do groceries and stuff like that, you have a lot of good towns near you. And there's a really good ice cream place in Frost Proof five minutes from the range that yeah that that's that's a killer right plus there's gators at the range too you can't you can't beat the little gator that lives in the park. <laughs> yeah. they have an evolution too i mean yeah see it's florida though i mean like what do you expect like louisiana yeah. you, you come on don't don't fail me now in louisiana every range has got to have a gator <laughs> <laughs> but uh i mean yeah i mean there's probably I don't know why there's we don't go back besides probably that Shannon's not there anymore but yeah I think it's because of the whole Shannon Frank thing yeah I mean here nor there it uh the nice is the bays are all close together like my old home club we used to have a style like like Universal uh or at Frost Proof you know you'd have bays going down one side then bays coming back another mm-hmm. was, you could walk right across like yeah easy peasy yeah um, you never needed to be in a car for transport or like a golf cart or anything for transport and stuff like that everything's easy to get to. Mm-hmm. really well laid out club yeah and and that's that saves a lot of time right there right you can still shoot zones mm-hmm. but those zones could be together and you don't have to honestly you wouldn't even have to do zones but that's the only way that they know how to do nationals so it, it makes sense to continue so doing i'm zones. doing zones this year for maryland state okay now are all the bays close together or are they so it's it's 11 bays contiguously next to each other okay so it's if you go from one if you go from stage eleven to stage one, then you have a pretty long walk. It's not super, it's not crazy long, but a lot of people complain about it. And I was like, okay, maybe we'll just do zones this year. Um, so we'll have zone one, zone two. So zone one will be the bigger base, and then zone two will be the smaller base. And in gotcha. between, you have the demo bay. Gotcha. So say I start on five, so I'll go five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and then you know, or six. Um, through, six it will 11. go uh, six to eleven. Okay, so and you then go one six, through five. So I so if it's six through eleven, I start on seven. I'll go seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, six, and then go whatever bay I start in the next zone. Yeah. Assuming. So so lunch will be the midpoint there. So the hard part's going to just be making sure the timing works out. But right. I think we'll, I, I think we didn't have that many backups last year, so I think we'll be okay timing wise. The turnover should be about the same. Right. Yeah. That, but that makes sense though too when you when you want to do it if you can do it that way too. Um, Dude, I don't have to spend like a thousand dollars on golf cart rentals. Oh yeah, just yeah, to that, transport that's... shooters because we had like a we had like a six seater last time. We had a six seater and a four seater driving people up and down, and they were probably busy nonstop and needed fuel or were they gasoline or were they battery powered? They were gas. Okay, but a lot of people actually just decided to walk instead because they didn't want to wait. By the time they by the time they got back, you know, having the, between having to navigate through all the shooters and the cars and everything, uh, they were just like, I'd rather walk. I was yeah. like, okay, well, don't complain then. <laughs> Now I know I don't know if you've um, but when John Royer was running the Carolina Classic at Rowan, they did mm-hmm. the, the last two years they did some funky thing where they stagger the stages. Yeah, um, every other bay is is the next stage. Mm-hmm. And have that, you, yeah, have you thought about doing that or or see how zones uh, work out? I thought about it, but I kind of like the idea of doing zones. Um, so we'll see. Uh, I'm uh, I'm always open to new ideas and actually hear listen to your podcast. I think it was with with uh, Steph Barry and uh, and John Royer uh, last year. I think it was. Um, I, I take a lot of uh, you know they've been doing this. They've been running majors longer, or at least Steph's been helping out with majors longer than I have. Mm-hmm. I think so. You know, I, there are a lot of lessons learned from there. So I I like taking ideas from them. Yeah. Um, so we'll see. Mm-hmm. No, and that is definitely a. Uh... <clears throat> It, it, it's an interesting idea and I, I kind of uh it might work for some ranges and that might be the case but uh do you gonna have two range masters or just one range master for maryland i think just one okay we we, we don't have that many rm calls in the first place mm-hmm. um at least for the last couple of years um the dq here and there uh but the dqs aren't what hold up squads and stuff like that it's always calibration and you know i, w- I was telling you before the show started that we pretty much only use mini poppers or it's like we're at like 90, 80 to 90% mini popper usage compared to uh, full size poppers. So we usually don't have many calibration calls. Um, mm-hmm. If it's anything, we had a couple prop failures last year um, on one stage specifically. Uh, and then we had a couple on one and then we fixed uh, uh, we fixed that one pretty quickly at lunchtime. So no problems from there on out. So I don't think, I don't anticipate having to use more than one range master. Mm-hmm. Um, if 
uh, Russell Forney is our RM, so if he wants to bring along his understudy or whatever, then he's more than welcome to, but I'm certainly not going to request it. Gotcha. Yeah. And yeah, like you said, if you don't, if you, there's typically not many issues because of how you do a setup, it makes it easy for one, right? Yeah. I, I think a lot of how a lot of the range master's job is, uh, or how much work he's going to have to do is going to be dependent on the set of crew and the match director. Mm -hmm. um, a, a lot of that, that, that's going to be a lot of it. Yeah. And, uh, the, the more work you take out of the, the range master's hands, the better, uh, it makes hundred percent. You don't have to call him. You're not waiting him for him to show up. You hassle, hassle free at that point. Yep. 100%. Mm -hmm. So I do want to I want to I want to segue away from match directing because this has actually been a great conversation about all this stuff. It's really been cool getting the development and the things of progression. We got to talk about the silly gun you be shooting. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. What are you talking about? I mean, it's it's pretty cool. It's got a rotating barrel. It's, it's I own 3 high points and I own 4 Italian high points. What's the problem? <laughs> Italian high points. <laughs> oh, yeah, Ben's probably like Oh, Keanu, no. <laughs> no, Ben knows I have uh, I have my issues with my high points. <laughs> he knows about that affair. <laughs> yeah. But um, so what were you? My curious is what were you shooting before the PX4s? Uh, an LTT ninety two. Okay. So the the ninety two G LTT Elite. And I've shooting? been shooting that gun since that was my production gun too. So I've been shooting ninety twos longer than any other gun I've been shooting in USPSA. Okay, so um, was that because Ben originally started with a, a 92, or it was just you had a fascination with a 92? No, I always liked them, and so as far as like factory guns goes, go goes like I really I really like Glocks, mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of what um, my my dad had a Glock, and that was his only handgun growing up, so that was all I learned how to shoot um, when I was younger. Uh, so. You know, naturally, I gravitated towards Glocks, but um, I I really like 92s. I had a friend who's a little bit older than who's a couple years older than me, so he got um, his hands on guns a little bit before me. So when we were at the range together, he loved 92s, and that was the first gun he bought. So I started shooting his 92s. I was like, man, I really like these guns. Um, and they, they shoot really well. It wasn't even because of Die Hard or anything like that, like or like Lethal Weapon. You know, it wasn't for any pop culture reasons. It was just because I liked how the 92 shot. So I, um, but no one made a 92 I liked. Like no one had one with the, uh, no one had one with a re removable front sight, uh, you know, dovetail front sight with a uh, with a with a decent rear sight, uh, or you know, uh, sometimes like the the triggers weren't my favorite. I like the shooting characteristics of the guns, but the the, the triggers weren't my favorite. I don't like the plastic triggers on the M9s and stuff like that. Um, so when LTT came out, or when Beretta came out with the LTT 92G Elite, I was like. This is everything I want in a 92. Mm -hmm. um, it's got the M9A1 frame, which I really like. Um, it's got a metal trigger, and it's got a... Which is funny, because I actually prefer the plastic trigger on the PX4. <laughs> but um, uh, it's got a metal trigger, it's got a dovetail front sight, and you know, and it's got a dovetail rear sight, so I can make it... So I can set it up for production with fiber optics and all that stuff. I don't need to worry about anything. And it's a vertex slide, so it's a light slide, not a brigadier slide. Mm -hmm. um, so that was... That's really what made me make the jump to shooting or to, to buying that gun and start shooting at USPSA. And you know, I was production curious at the time, and that was really what pushed me towards it. Yeah, I, and they LTT makes a fantastic gun. Like uh, a couple shows prior to this, well, we're recording on two twenty five, so tomorrow's episode on two twenty six is Les Kiss Martoni's episode. Gotcha. So we talked a little bit about Barretta's and uh, you know him, and uh, I mean if. if People, if you haven't listened to the Les Kiss Martoni episode, please go to it. It's a good show. Uh, Les is a good dude. Uh, so I got to plug within my own show sometimes because I, it, you know, it's it's real world, real world things, right? I, it's okay. Les and I are technically on the same team, so we're good. Right, exactly. So, um, so yes, go listen to the Les Kiss Martoni show. But anyway, the LTT, you know, it was always fascinating to me, right? Now, some people complain that the optics sits a little bit higher uh, than other guns. It does, but I mean. But it's a better it's a better mounting platform, I think, in uh, some regards, especially compared to, uh, I think, the factory uh, Beretta mounting system now. Uh, yeah, I, I have I have two ninety two X RDOs, and they both have the the D law plates, mm -hmm. which is uh, someone on someone on Reddit. I, I found him through Reddit. Uh, he he made his own mounting solution for the um, for the RDO models, and it's way better than the factory Beretta option. It's way better than the Tony Systems option. Um, mm -hmm. So I have both of those in my guns. 
or on, on my two guns that I used in IPSC last year. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the LTT solution is, is fantastic. Uh, it really doesn't sit that much higher if you compare it to like a Glock MOS mm -hmm. um, or like any, any factory, most factory plate systems, I think save for like the Walther, which is really, really low. Um, right. it's, it's really not that much lower or it's not that much higher. It's perceived as being higher because it's, it's a hammer fired gun with a relatively high bore axis. So it just looks higher, but I think relative to the bore, the optic is still pretty low. Gotcha. Yeah. Which, yeah, which, I mean, I remember when people were talking about that, like there was a big deal breaker for some people, but it's like, you put a dot on a gun and then you shoot it, right? It's one of those things. You've... Now, mm -hmm. the, the cool part is, you know, with an LTT-92, uh, you know, you get the trigger drab, trigger job in a bag option as well. You know, you get to have Ernest uh, fiddle fart with your gun or whoever mm -hmm. does your gunsmithing now. Um, yeah. Because I remember, I want to say the LTT came out before I even got into competition. The so, 92 G came out, the LTT 92 G came out in 2018, I want to say. Yeah, that sounds about Because I bought right. mine in 2020, I think. Mm -hmm. Or I'm sorry, I bought mine in 2019. Pre COVID prices. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was still the same price, about. I think I paid $1,100 for mine. That's, that's still not bad. Like, if you think about it, that's not a bad price for a, especially a, a tuned gun at that point. It's not, but if you think about, like, I, I think they're only about twelve hundred dollars right now with the iron sights. Mm -hmm. The problem now is uh, over the last like four years, optics mounting has become default options. So everything is everything anyone serious is considering buying isn't is at an you're either buying like a Glock MOS or you're paying an extra you know fifty bucks or whatever. Um, but for you know in, in the case of Berettas, you're either buying Beretta solution or buying LTT solution. Mm -hmm. With LTTs, you're spending a default extra three hundred dollars. Yeah, it's a better solution, but it's still an extra three hundred dollars. Right. Yeah, and I, honestly, if your gun, if a gun nowadays doesn't come out f optic ready, it's it's not even worth looking at, in my opinion. It, well, I can't say that in all cases because there might be a cool gun just to have an optic cut it yet. No, that's my biggest thing. That was my biggest thing. That's what everyone's complaining about when the new uh, PX4 GSD came out. Uh, everyone was saying the 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 PX4 GSD. That like that was twenty twenty four shot show, right? Yeah, that's okay. this gun. Oh, okay. Uh, the the heavy barrel, the, the heavy barrel PX four. When that whole when that thing came out, when the new PX four compact carry came out, the compact carry two, it was a huge. Yeah, everyone on the internet gets upset about it because they're saying, "Oh, why isn't it red dot ready?" And blah 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 blah. And anyone who's spoken to people who work at Beretta will know that to get Beretta to make one change is like steering a cruise ship. It's well, a mm -hmm. super involved process and it takes forever and everything like bread is very bureaucratic I've, uh, at least to my understanding and everything all changes take forever to to to, to take place um and just you know trying to make design improvements or iterations like that it takes years yeah well if you think about it too beretta really pistols aren't beretta's main squeeze shotguns shotguns are shotguns really are i mean well I, the m9 is a really big thing with beretta just because of you know between military and pop culture references yeah um but uh, we're lucky to, to us 12 PX4 shooters that are out there. We're lucky enough that we got some sort of iterative improvement. Um, yes. But I'm not really complaining about them not having an RDO cut because LTT is almost certainly will do it better than they did. If you see if if you if you want to compare the, the 92 LTT optic cut versus the the 92 RDO on the from Beretta. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not really too too concerned about that. Right. Um, so it is just more costly. Yes, it is, it is more costly. So, what made you leave the ninety two to go to the PX four? Like, what about the gun made you want to go to the PX four? Uh, so, you know, much like production, I was PX four curious. Mm -hmm. uh, so, in two years ago, I shot one at a at, at a local match. Um, I didn't shoot one like in the match. I shot one after the match, and I was like, man, this gun kind of this gun's kind of awesome. So I started doing some research, and I, I came across all of uh, Ernest's videos on the PX4, and I came across um, Paracast podcast videos on the PX4, and I watched all of those, and I was like, man, maybe this is something I should consider. Uh, so I, I, uh, I went ahead and I got myself a compact. I, tra I traded my, my Century Arms SP5 for a Glock 45 with an RMR and a PX4 compact. Mm -hmm. uh, with my friend and I shot the PX4 compact and I started carrying it. And I was like, man, I really, really like how this gun shoots. It wasn't the full size, but I said, I really like how this gun shoots. Um, 
and I started I, and I play around with it in practice and stuff like that, and uh, you know just stick around at the range. And, uh, and and I think in the last year, my friend was like, you know, my friends are griefing me for shooting this gun because mm-hmm. most people think it's it's fifty fifty whether it's the most beautiful gun or the ugliest gun in the world. Um, and they, they all think it's you know crap and stuff like that. Blah 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 blah. You know, it's that's what friends do, right? That's how you know they're good friends. Um, but I told my friend, I said, I, I bet, I bet I'll beat you with a PX4 at nationals. <laughs> I said, you have to, you have to buy me dinner. I'll beat you. And he took me up on it. So it literally started as a joke. Oh, okay. And then I shot nationals. I shot, I shot all of nationals with it last year in 2024. I didn't come out that great because again, I switched a new gun. Um, and I, you know, learning curve and teething and all that stuff, right? There's switching platforms all together. Uh, and I was like, I actually really like how this gun shoots. The, the full size shoots really, really well, really well in USPSA. So I think I'm just keep on shooting it this year. Mm-hmm. Um, and it part of it was also just because the PX4 is allegedly more durable. And I've broken, um, I've only broken one part on N92, and that was the firing pin. Uh, I've never broken a trigger return spring or anything like that. So I, but I was like, I hate replacing parts. I hate doing maintenance on my guns. I hate you know having to change anything out. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was like, let me just give this a try. I'll, I'll run this for a while and I'll see how it goes. And then, you know, now 20, 2024, here we are. Yeah. And then, and here you are, you're shooting the PX4. Um, you've even come out with, uh, solutions for their magazines. Like, um, yeah, and that was all because of nationals. Um, mm-hmm. I, I did all of that. The first, um, yeah. So I came out with the PX, it was initially a PX4 competition follower and then we made some small design changes to make it work across multiple guns um Mm -hmm. so but but my my original px4 followers were existing followers i had laying around for the 2011 that i had the ground down and filed down to fit in the px4 magazine so i at least have a competitive capacity at nationals so instead of going with 21 rounds at nationals i at least i was or 22 rounds out i was lucky enough to have 24 Oh, that, yeah, that must have been very nice. So um, now for the PX4, what base pad works on those magazines? There is only one. I've tried others. I've tried I, I, I've tried 92 base pads. I've tried P320 base pads. I've tried... Um, what else have I tried? I've, I had a friend try Tanfo base pads for me um, mm-hmm. and Checkmate base pads, and none of them work. So the only, your, your only solution is... Uh, this the Springer Precision base pad. That's the only one that will work and will fit the gauge. P three twenty base pads might fit, but they might not gauge. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, and they're durable enough. Obviously, they're made by Springer, so they're durable enough to survive. Yeah. Uh, the, the The problem with the Springers, the at least the first generation, is the set screw they use um, that can strip, and a lot of people do end up stripping them. Um, and I learned that you actually have to fit the magazines to the base pad. So so the flange at the very bottom where the base pad locks in, you have to ground down the back of that to get the set screw to fit properly, and then you won't have any um, issues with it stripping or anything like that. It'll just go in and out really easy. But they redesigned it recently, so it's a single screw that goes up, and then it threads from the bottom, so you don't have to, you don't have an exposed screw head anymore. Gotcha. Okay, that's that's better than uh, the original generation then. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a much better design. Right, so... And then you shove, so you shove a, a, is it a Metgar tube or a Beretta tube? Beretta tube. Okay. Metgar doesn't make uh, PX4 mags. At least not yet, I'm not sure. Hopefully they uh, get some love and make Metgar to make better tubes for them. <laughs> yeah, at least it's the, yeah, Beretta mags are not, the OEM mags, whether for the 92 or for the PX4, they're not my favorite. Right. So, uh, so I, was, I guess this is a good segue, right, from the PX4s to, uh, to uh, CSRG, right? So you started with your own, you know, follower in, you know, mm-hmm. some Springs. Um, and what made you, besides going on this thing for personal gain, I guess, uh, or personal <laughs> glory, I guess, to say, I did it. Um, what made you really want to be, become official, right? Well, so we had been, CSRG had been, we had been doing business before um, selling the, before our storefront launched. Okay. So um, before we, we started, we, we did, um, the Maryland wear and carry uh, certifications. So you get your carry permit here in Maryland. Uh, 
after the uh, Bruin case in 2022. Mm-hmm. 2022, yeah, 2022. So we we did wear and carry classes, but with more of a practical shooting aspect in the live fire portion of training. And then we also did um, uh, march training, which I don't remember what march is, but it's like it's it's EMS training or um, mass casualty training, stuff like that. Uh, so we included that in our classroom portion as well, because Maryland didn't prescribe what you had to go over. They only gave you a four hour curriculum. They said the rest is your problem. Okay. And it's a 16 hour class. Oof. Yeah. So we had to fill it and we wanted to make it good. So we, so we, we did that um, for a few years and it actually let us bankroll um, getting funding into getting the website up, getting, um, you know, buying a bunch of springs, getting the followers going um, and all that stuff. So that was kind of uh, the, the segue from training to storefront was, was really just what was really Maryland saying you can't do online classes anymore. Because our classroom portion, at least for the for the four hour boring part, um, for, for eight hours of classroom, you had to have eight hours of classroom. Um, that was uh, that was gone, and my my business partner and I were like, we're not going to do that. I don't I don't want to sit on the range for two days straight teaching. If I want to sit on the range for two days straight, it's going to be at a match, right? Um, so that was like, so we, we don't we don't do hardly any training anymore, uh, and then. Yeah. But I said, okay, well, it'd be nice to have some money, and it'd be nice to have some stuff to sh- continue to fund our shooting. So we decided to launch the storefront, and I, I honestly didn't even think I would sell fifty of these things, of, of these followers and springs. But I've sold hundreds at this point. So right. I, 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 I do feel person, very right? blessed, huh? <laughs> Not just a one person. No, right? <laughs> no. And I, I, and I have a few retailers too. So I have uh, Langdon Tactical sells them, obviously, mm-hmm. um, and Red Red Hill. Uh, Red Hill up in Hagerstown sells them, and Cindy's Hotshot sells them, uh, which is a local uh, shooting range uh, out in Glen Burnie. Well, that's cool. Well, that, well, I mean, that's better, right? So they, they place orders, they sell them, and then they tell you, hey, we need some more, and then you sell them and they let them get yeah. it, right? Yeah, so it's... I haven't had any fills on the... I haven't had any refills on the orders just yet, but I think Langdon's been moving a good bit of them, so I'm hoping they have an order soon. Right. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's been... It, it, it's It's been surprisingly better than I thought. Right. Well, and, and and the nice thing too is right. Three D techno three D printed technology has come so far since its uh, in, um, inception. So you can make so many cool different prototypes or things with it mm-hmm. that actually are durable. Yep. Almost, if not more durable than injection molding. Pla- you know, injection molding. Yeah, I mean, like, look, uh, what was it? The, the the AC Designs guys use three D printing um, along with uh, metal injection or casting or something like that. Um, MBX does, and MBX sells freaking more magazines, springs, and followers than I'm sure anyone else, than, than any other company combined at mm-hmm. this point. Um, and uh, Double Alpha initially, their followers were initially 3D printed as well, and until they moved to injection molding. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it definitely takes a takes a big investment to move to injection molding, right? It's definitely that's a lot of money. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, it, uh, a lot of money and a lot of uh, other uh, other factors, right? What do you, what do you want? You know, plastic is more in depth than just oh, it's it's this type of plastic. It's like yeah. well, well, let's you would know, more. right? Yeah, I would know, right? <laughs> I deal with a uh, I deal with this on a daily basis uh, in the plastics world. So, uh, but yeah, so th- that's really cool is that people are actually buying your you know individuals and companies are buying your product and using it in their end product or having it available for their consumers. So that's cool. Um, we also talked. I knew Robert Wire was talking to about. Uh, the dry fire stands on the paracast not too long ago so it got me intrigued about that so uh it's it's honestly a cool product um you want to share what that really is uh, i'm yeah, bastardizing so it so it's uh well people who've listened to this can't see it but i mean it's just a simple 3d printed stand that i made that uh, see after there we go there you that go I, that i fabbed up uh and it's just it, it just gives you enough clearance for uh, if you want to print your own 3D printed target or if you want to use the Ben Steger Pro Shop targets um, since instead of uh, sticking them to your wall or whatever, if you want to mount them, put them on a bookshelf or put them on a table or something like that. So it, this was good because I this was really done out of my own interest just because uh, wall space, it's if I'm going to stick something to the wall, I'm just going to do the go fast, don't suck stick uh, targets. Mm-hmm. But if I want something closer, um, you know, like a low target to practice on or a close target, you know, do like an accelerator or something like that. This having my own little mobile stand really helps. Um, just because I can put it around wherever I want to. 
Right, and it, it honestly, you can d- dramatically change uh, a mini stage or a layout comparatively with it. So it's yeah, it's it's people should not be sleeping on these. These are pretty cool. I mean, they are one of the only things in stock in your website at the moment. But uh, <laughs> that's not a bad thing for me, though. This uh, is cool. I if, if I, I, people have been emailing me actually, which is surprising. Also, that I'm asking when stuff is coming back in stock. So everything will be coming back in stock later this week. That's awesome. Yeah. At least for the two products that people actually buy. Mm-hmm. Hey, nothing wrong with that, right? Now, <laughs> yeah. The more people buy replacement followers, or do they buy the spring follower kits? Oh, so we've only been selling the spring and the springs and followers for this point six or seven months now. So most people haven't gone to replace them. Mm-hmm. Um, I have had, I think I've had two people order replacement spring sets, um, mm-hmm. but they will the the mounting. The mounting coil on the spring is actually similar to an MBX, so I did have someone actually someone actually uh, bought twenty five of them to use in uh, in all of his MBX followers because uh, they're I sell them cheaper. There you go. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. Yeah. You make some money off of it, so hey, why not? He, right? he saves money, I make money. You know, we're all happy, right? Right, consumerism. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty cool. Now, do you, where would you like to see um, CSRG in like five years? You know, I really haven't thought about that. Uh, I, I haven't really thought about growing aggressively or anything like that. Um, I, one, I don't know if I have, I don't have the resources or the, or the time to do that. Um, I'm, I'm honestly content. I would like, I would obviously like to sell, you know, thousands of dollars of product a month, uh, which th- that would be easy for, you know, that, that would be ideal. And that would be still pretty low effort on my end, because it would just be a matter of, you know, printing the followers, getting them on there and just, you know, shipping them out. Um, so it's pretty low effort. Um, and I, I don't want to lose any sort of quality and customer service or anything like that, or any sort of connection to, to the customer base. So, you know, I, it, it's a cool thought to grow, to, you know, end up having my own building, having my own storefront or whatever, and having my own like fulfillment center or whatever, all else. But, but, but in the end, um, I don't prioritize this over my day job, right? Um, and I, my, my day job is I have I have a pretty good job, and I, I like I like my work, so I don't want to have to kind of deprioritize that over CSRG as much as I do like running CSRG. Um, so right now I'm I'm content just you know having orders come in in the middle of the day, ship them out by you know four o'clock when I'm off work, and um don't have to do anything else so I'm, I'm happy with that right now i'd like to sell more products and think about an expanded product line but still uh you know my my business partner is really into um he wants to do more uh, lifestyle stuff so he wants to do more hats he wants to do um we, we have the sun hoodies that was his first that was his first uh, big initiative that he wanted to take um and he wants to do like you know shorts polos and all that stuff and subtly you know subtly branded stuff that people can wear every day Mm -hmm. uh that you know that doesn't scream i own guns and stuff like that you know so it's like business casual or like you know golf golf course casual kind of apparel right that makes sense you know so you need you've got to have your uh um, you've got to have your uh, your cargo shorts, your uh, your polo shirts, and uh, yeah, and your. Well, it, it'll uh, be like uh, you know, people are really into short shorts now, so we'll get seven inch inseams. Oh gosh! Yeah. You know, where where you squat, something might show that you don't want to show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> something like that. Um, but no, like I mean, just like casual, like you know, the the people are really into uh, athleisure apparel mm-hmm. now, so that's kind of what what we're going towards as far as lifestyle stuff but as far as like you know the gun parts side um i have a couple ideas that aren't like uh i, w- I want to start selling core belts because I-, I use core belts and i really like core um i use their competition belt. i have their everyday carry belt mm-hmm. um i'm a really big fan of their stuff um and and i think that would be a good thing to have just on hand uh just to just to sell and or you know just to support um people with uh i i, I want to get more involved in i'm, I'm sponsoring uh, we're sponsoring uh maryland state and delmarva this year so i want to start i want to support more staff i want to support more matches and stuff like that so you know to do that i do have to grow a little bit mm-hmm. um or at least uh or at least get some money so i can buy hollow suns and trigicons or whatever to send the matches and call that good right uh, yeah well and that's the hard part about being a small business right like and you always want to get back to 
you know, the matches, but it's like, a, you know, you at least have a product, right? Like, I know some yeah. businesses, it's like a service kind of based thing. And it's like, what do I do? Put it on the prize table and then no one wants it, right? It's like. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. So, so this one, I'll probably give away like dry fire target stands. Um, and uh, I already, you know, for for Del Marvo, we're going to, for the staff, we're giving a Hollis and 507 comp to them um, oh, for nice. the staff draw. Um, it would be cool to do other stuff, but um, yeah. And uh, what's cool is I'm I'm actually I'm helping uh, LTT. I'm I'm repping LTT and myself at Delmarva at the uh, for a mini match or something like that. Um, that will be sponsored by LTT uh, to shoot a uh, you know it, it'll be shoot a mini match and you win a prize or whatever based on like, placement stuff like that. Um, but also to to demo the new uh, PX4 that, that just came out. So, uh, you know, we'll be using that in conjunction with the Spring of Precision base pads along with my followers and Springs. So mm -hmm. kind of it's so we have like a whole ecosystem going at the match and that would be that that's going to be really cool to to um, to show off at Delmarva. Yeah, it, def it definitely will be that. That's going to be a cool thing. I think that uh, people are going to enjoy as well. You know, side matches, side matches need to become more of a thing. Uh, I matches. agree. Yeah. So I'm looking to, into doing something similar for uh, Maryland State. Mm hmm. That'll be cool. I, I mean, if if more if you've got the space for the bays and you've got the people, might as well try to figure it yeah, out. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. But um, that's kind of cool. Um, let's see. I got. I have a few more questions for you before our time is up here tonight. Um, yep. But uh, so your PX4, um, essentially, you know, it's whatever the the Langdon offers at this point for them, or uh, or did you? Yeah. So this one's like the that? full. So this, the, the gun I have now, the GSD is the full suite from them. So it's got the, um, you know, it's, it's, it's the GSD. So it's got the heavy barrel on it and it comes with the carry levers standard, like the low profile carry levers, um, and the low profile slide stop. And it also has, it's got the RDO cut obviously, and it's got the NP3 barrel, uh, and NP3 parts and the cut and crown barrel and the gray guns trigger. So it's, it's pretty much everything that they offer on their site, except for the match hammer, which I intentionally opted out of. Um, it's the match hammer basically takes all the take up out of the, eats all the slack up on the single action. And I'm so used to having that, that, uh, that amount to prep that I, I don't want to go from that. Cause I'm sure I'm a hundred percent certain that I will probably send around where I don't want to send on stage. Uh, and I want to avoid that. <laughs> um, so I opted for pretty much everything except for the Boresight Solution Stippling and the Match Hammer and the Comp. And the Comp is obviously just because I can't use it in carry optics or anything like that. Right. You you know you want to shoot a PX4 in uh, in open. <laughs> <laughs> I you know I do if if there were a stouter comp out there like if there were if there were titanium comp out there that were like you know two large chambers I might be so bold as to try it. Mm -hmm. Um, cause this gun will swallow a major round, um, Ooh. but maybe not until they come out with something a little bit sturdier. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I don't blame you, but, uh, it would be pretty cool to see, uh, a PX4 and open. I'm not going to lie. That's, oh, uh, oh, the brain is, it's already, I, I think people are already cringe enough seeing a PX4 and carry optics. This is true. You yeah. Just... But, but I think there will be more coming because, uh, there are, there, there were like six people at the lat in my January match who asked to shoot my PX4, uh, mine and Ben's PX4. So we had, we had a small demo thing going, and everyone who shot it really liked it. And uh, I know a couple people have already picked a few up, and then a couple people have already ordered GSEs and stuff like that. So okay. there, I think it's people. You have to shoot it to appreciate the gun because if you just look at it, if you just watch videos on it, you're not really going to care. But you have to shoot the gun because the gun really does sell itself. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's cool that people are. Uh interested in shooting the gun uh, you know to see if they want to buy one so that is pretty cool that you're able to uh uh pimp them out as a, i will say pimp them out but in a in a in an organic way right yeah it's not like <laughs> not like you're selling them on the street corner right like uh five dollar specials or anything but if you ask some of my friends that is basically what i'm doing but yeah again that's what friends do so right nothing wrong with that though but um, no so i guess uh uh, you know, you, you, you're, you know, you, you are a part owner in, um, CSRG. Uh, do you have any other partners or, uh, uh um, sponsorship or stuff like that that you deal with or, um, no, I mean, I, so I'm shooting for Lane and tactical this year. 
Okay. So I'm repping them this year. Uh, yeah, other than that, I'm just I'm repping them myself. Gotcha. Yeah. I, I try and keep. I, I don't. I've always had this perception of sponsorship where I don't want to be beholden to someone else. Mm-hmm. And I'm okay with like the lightning thing is fine because I'm I'm friends with Ernest and you know we're we're on good terms and I and he at least as far as like social media posting and and you know. And, and all this other stuff that a lot of other people have to deal with. Um, I'm, I, I don't, I'm like 99% sure I'm not beholden to that. So it's kind of just go shoot and people demo the guns and stuff like that. And I was, uh, and I think that's the best way to get people. You're not going to get people by spamming with people on the internet anyway. Right. right? Yeah, like, absolutely. It, you it have a pro- if you have a product you actually believe in, you actually think is, you, and you actually see as a good product. Um, and you support that product, then people will be more inclined to, uh, uh, try it at least like like the ps4 for example like this wasn't um i didn't beg langdon or anything for this but mm-hmm. it was I, I genuinely really just do love this gun and i really do try and get as many people to shoot it because i i mean yeah sure i buy, i financially benefit from it because you can only buy my followers and i'm i'm the only shop that sells px4 followers but 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 in the end i really do genuinely love the px4 mm-hmm well, and that's the best way to put it, right? You like the gun, it sells itself, and it's organic, right? It's not forced. Yeah. And and that's, and, and, and I'm the same way as well, right? Like, if I don't like it, I'm not going to post about it, and nor am I going to be forced to post about anything, right? Like, yeah. everyone I deal with, I will say this, they're super laid back, you know, they, they do business with me because it's me, not the fact that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to make a million posts or about it. You know, it's, if I talk about it, it's because I want to. It's, it's the yeah. cool thing about, you know. People no, this is good. I mean, like, we haven't had any sponsorship, sponsored content or anything like that. We got nothing to shove mm-hmm. down people's throats other than buy buy from csrgstore.us. <laughs> right? Yep. You, you got like, you got to. Well, hey, like, you, you know, I I made a purchase before we started. Was just yeah. Like, oh, this is so cool. thank like, you for that. I'm super grateful. Right? Like, so I mean, you know, it's it's how we help. We support each other. We grow a little bit. Um, each each per, you know, each order leads to another one and. And, you know, when you can tell somebody about, hey, if you're having this issue, go buy this thing. It's going to solve your problem. Like those stands, they, they honestly will solve a problem for people. And and if they, it works for them, and it, if it doesn't work, it's like $3 a stand. It's $3 you know, a stand. Like, like you're not losing out a whole lot. Right. Exactly. You can find another use for it. So I can't. Yeah. Like, put your pictures, put your family's pictures on it. Ex- there you go. There you, <laughs> you can keep the significant other happy about it. So, That's right. Um, so Keanu, if people um, obviously they can go to CSRG uh, store.us if they want to make a purchase, if they want to talk to you about uh, you know PX4s and whatnot, uh, what's the best place to reach you at? Um, you can find me on Facebook. I'm pretty sure I'm the only Keanu site on Facebook. Um, mostly sure, uh, but otherwise, um, you know, you can reach out to me. At, uh, my email is Keanu at CSRG.us if you want to ask me on email. Mm-hmm. Um, but for people who live in the modern era, you can just slide into my DMs on Instagram. So my handle is please don't chop six. Um, so PLS no, and then chop six with an X instead of a CKS. Uh, it's it's a private account, so you have to send because my I post my family on there and stuff like that. So you'll have to. Um, it'll be a message request, but I will see it. Um, but I think that's usually how most people tend to reach out to me for that kind of stuff. Yes, I mean, well, you know, it's the easy. Most people just like, oh, I'll find you on the internet, and mm-hmm. it's easy, Instagram is the easy way to go. Yeah, but, uh, or find me in person. I, I run the Thermont Conservation Sportsman Club uh, monthly USPSA match. So, if you want to find me in person, you can find me in person. You can email my TS. My, you can email my club USPSA uh, account too, if you because that's that's publicly available in practice score. Right. So there you go. Go shoot the match. Go support them on CSRG uh, Store US. Uh, Go find them and stalk them on Instagram. But uh, Keanu, brother, thank you for your time tonight and chit-chatting with me about the PX4 and everything you've done throughout the shooting sports. Uh, we appreciate you and your time, so thank you, sir. Well, thanks, man. I really appreciate it. This was, uh, this was good. This was awesome. This it was. And it was a good conversation, and uh, uh, Ben's just going to have to try to top it whenever he en- eventually shows up. So, uh, <laughs> let me let me know when he does so I can crash that one. Yes. <laughs> and I can let, just shit-talk him the entire time. Yes, absolutely. So, Keanu, thank you. And to the listeners, get out and do the things. I will see you on the next one.